I love a captive audience. Um, I was talking to someone earlier about my first year here when I was asked to be at the State Fair and I followed folks from the Raptor Center that had uh, this huge eagle on his arm and then they, they announced and next we have the University Librarian and I've never seen 200 people go f away as fast as they could. So. Thank you for staying around. <laughs> so wonderful to have you here, and uh, this is a terrific event um, to, to have uh, to honor Kate De Camillo, this year's recipient of the prestigious uh, Curlin Award. And if you take a look at the Curlin winners over the 38 years, uh, you'll see all of your favorites, I'm sure. The first award was presented to not one but three authors. Marie Hall Etz, Marie Marguerite Henry, Elizabeth Coatsworth, all of whom went on to win Caldecott and Newberry Awards. And then we had Tommy DiPaolo, Lois Lowry, Nancy Carlson, and last year's winner, Karen, Karen Nelson Hoyle, the collection's longtime curator, who was responsible for building that collection to the international stature we know today. And this year we get to add Kate DiCamillo to this galaxy of truly outstanding authors. The Curlin Award is presented annually and named for Dr. Irvin Curlin, an alum of the university who generously donated his extensive collection of manuscripts and original art and signed first editions to the university libraries. And we have a long tradition of supporting and preserving literature for children. We don't merely preserve them in those caverns underneath Anderson Library, but we also support authors and make all of their works accessible to truly global audience. And we also, along with our Curl and Friends, offer a wonderful programs and exhibits such as the event today. I want to make sure and thank all of our donors, uh, the creators who entrust the, to us the care of their works for future generations of scholars who want to delve into that creative process. And also the Curlin Collection would not exist without the support of the Curlin Friends. And if I could have those of you who are a friend wave your, wave your hand. Just look at all of you out there. <laughs> wonderful. Truly wonderful, and as, as you heard earlier, you can join if you're not a friend. We'd love to have you. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce two great friends from the Curlin Collection, Curlin Friends board members Julie Schumacher and Mary Rockcastle. I'm Julie Schumacher, here along with Mary, both of us on the advisory board here at the Curlin, and both of us along with the honoree today, members of a wacky but um, somewhat oddly exclusive writing group known as Women Who Wine, spelled W-I-N-E. <laughs> and uh, together we're going to be very happy to introduce Kate to you. I had thought of giving my portion, my half of this introduction in the traditional way, offering some biographical information and then listing some of Kate's many well-deserved accolades and awards, including, I'm nervous, why am I nervous, I have to slow down, including of course the Newberry, the Newberry Honor Citation, a Theodore Zeus Geisel Medal, a Boston Globe Horn Book Award, plays, Hollywood films made from her novels, and many more. But then I went back to her books for inspiration and I looked again at the moment in Because of Winn-Dixie when India Opal Baloney, growing up in a single parent home in Florida and emboldened by the mangy dog she's just dragged home from a grocery store, tells her father that, quote, since I am 10 years old, you should tell me 10 things about my mama. Just 10 things, that's all. So I'm gonna tell you 10 things about Kate. <laughs> and I'm not capable. <laughs> worried? I know, and well, she should be. Um, I can't do PowerPoint, so Mary here is my PowerPoint because... Vanna. <laughs> Vanna. So here's the first one. I'll just, you just okay. hold them up when I okay. give you the word. It, it'll be a minute. So number one, Kate is a serious word wizard, a magician of language whose deceptively simple sentences belie an incredible sophistication. Do not play Scrabble with this woman. <laughs> She will chatter away at you the entire time, crushing your ability to think in any way clearly. 
And even if you might be lucky enough to spell, for example, the seven letter word aquavit yeah. on a triple word space, she will still beat you. <laughs> Number two. Though extremely fun loving, I think most people have heard her laugh, she is the most disciplined writer I know of with an ironclad agreement between herself and the universe regarding her writing schedule. She advises others who want to write to make a commitment to the act of writing, but I don't know anyone as committed to the writing as she is. Number three, as a person who's created emotionally rich and complex characters who are animals, Despero, Edward Tulane, Mercy Watson, and in her new book, A Squirrel Named Ulysses, Kate, you may be shocked to hear this, detests cats. <laughs> Number four. I'm allergic. You are not. She is, <laughs> she's very rude to cats, but not to anything else. Number four. As a person who can be a championship talker, she's a master of succinctness. Like E.B. White, she boils entire worlds and lives down beautifully into watertight sentences and paragraphs. In The, Magician Elef in the Magician's Elephant, the reader learns that it is important that you say what you mean to say. Time is too short. You must speak the words that matter. And that is what Kate does. Number five. Kate and her books promote a belief in storytelling and in literature and in the ability of art to change and improve us. In The Tiger Rising, Rob, the main character, realizes why he likes his friend Sistine. He liked her because when she saw something beautiful, the sound of her voice changed. When she spoke, he felt as if the world, the real world, had been punched through so that he could see something wonderful and dazzling on the other side. Number six, Kate acknowledges the danger and the seduction and the intoxication of narrative, the need to unsettle and occasionally even frighten the reader because literature is not frivolous and it is not to be taken lightly, while simultaneously drawing that reader heart pounding right into her books. The world is dark and light is precious. Come closer, dear reader. You must trust me. I am telling you a story. Seven, like Kate, her characters are persistent, brave, and tenacious. They don't knuckle under. They may be small, and at times they may want to give up. I am done with hope. <laughs> Some of these are so short, but I just wanted to print them out. <laughs> I am done with hope, thought Edward Tulane. But they are saved by their courage, keep going, Mary, and by empathy, and by the belief that if you open your heart, someone will come for you. Eight, contrary to what many people believe about children's literature being full of dancing unicorns and puppies and rainbows, Kate honors her readership by not shying away from sadness, which, along with humor, permeates her work. Her characters at times suffer from hunger, loneliness, grief, cruelty, fear, injustice, and rage. Their parents abandon them or even trade them for a red tablecloth. As per Because of Win dixie it is a sorrow-filled world. Number nine, but Kate does not wallow in sadness, neither does she try to wipe it away in her novels or make it disappear. Her books are litmus lozenges. We still experience the sadness, but it is the sadness punctuated and tempered by hope and by the knowledge that compassion and love are quite nearby. 10, finally, Kate D. Camillo loves the word astonishment. And in a sincere and non-cheesy way, she believes in miracles. There you go. I promise to always turn back toward you, says Flora, in Flora and Ulysses, The Illuminated Adventures. We feel that sense of promise in all of Kate's work, which is full with astonishments and miracles of many kinds, and also with the assurance that when we sit down to open one of her novels, the impossible is about to happen again. Like Julie, I am honored to share in the introduction of this talented, generous, remarkable, little, big woman. <laughs> um, it is very fitting that the Curlin should honor Katie Camillo, 
quote, in recognition of singular attainments in the creation of children's literature and an appreciation for generous donation of unique resources to the Curlin Collection for the study of children's literature. I chose to focus on Kate's gifts to the community of writers here in Minnesota and beyond, and I'll start with the Curlin. The production materials that Kate has donated to the collection, starting in 1997, include typescripts, front matter, select correspondence, notes, page proofs, galley proofs, dummies, and layout notes for all five of her award-winning novels, for Louise, The Adventures of a Chicken, for seven Mercy Watson titles, and for Bink and Golly. Anyone who is interested in seeing the evolution of a finished book, studying firsthand the changes an accomplished writer makes to a manuscript over time, can do so by coming to the Curlin, you have to register first, and paging through the notes and the multiple corrected typescripts donated by Kate to the collection. Kate was also instrumental in helping to launch the low residency MFA in writing for children and young adults at Hamlin University. In 2006, she was among a small group of local writers who came to me to discuss the possibility of creating such a program at Hamlin. We already had a traditional MFA focusing on writing for adults. Starting another MFA was a big undertaking. You have to do this, Rock Castle, she said. <laughs> the Twin Cities need this kind of program. She was very determined. She agreed to serve as a member of the faculty for the first two semesters, allowing us to use her name to help launch the program. Although she stepped down from the faculty after that, she has maintained a close, ongoing relationship with us, with our students, alums, and faculty. She has created an annual scholarship the Herman W. Block Scholarship, named after the library in her first book, Because of Winn-Dixie, to be offered to the incoming student, judged by faculty and Kate, to have the highest potential for success in the writing of children's literature. So far, we've given out two such scholarships, and we'll be given out a third in January. The graduates of our program have a say in whom we invite as the keynote speaker at their commencement ceremony held always on the final Sunday of the residency. Kate was asked and agreed to be the commencement speaker on January 19, 2009. Not long before the residency was to start, Kate's mother Betty became very ill and was hospitalized. By commencement day, Betty was near death. Kate, refusing to disappoint the students, left the hospital, came to Hamlin and gave the address. It was eloquent, heartfelt, and inspiring. Here's a very brief excerpt from that speech. I'm channeling Kate now. <laughs> I've thought long and hard about what I want to say to you today, both what I feel I need to tell you and what I think you need to hear. I've thought about what your journey means to me and what this community means to me and what words and stories mean to me. You are going to leave this program and go out into the world and you will find what you know already to be true. There is a supreme indifference to art, to storytelling, to poetry in this culture. In spite of the fact that in the words of William Carlos Williams, men die miserably every day for lack of what is found there. And there is too the plain and simple truth that it is hard to keep doing what we do. The work of writing is hard. It is hard to get it right, hard to push ourselves again and again and again to get it right. So how do we keep going? Kate quoted Ray Bradbury who said that living at risk, living as an artist, writing a novel is like jumping off a cliff and building wings on the way down. <laughs> Kate discovered that it can work in the reverse too. She shared how in writing The Magician's Elephant, the book became, quote, a ladder that I built as I climbed up. I put the full weight of myself on each rung of the ladder. I let it hold me, and I climbed. I need to tell you, and you need to hear that words don't fail, and that the sound of a single voice, singing or reading, is capable of lifting someone else up off the ground. 
Kate left the ceremony and returned to the hospital where her mother died the next day. I have always described Kate as a godmother to our program. Since that commencement address, I have considered Betty DiCamillo a godmother as well. Kate will be serving for the second time as the keynote speaker on July 20th of this year. I'll end with a personal anecdote. It's, it's okay. <laughs> in the fall of this year, I fell off a backyard deck while in the company of our August Curlin Award winner, Julie Schumacher, Schumacher, and the rest of our wonderful women who wine group, some of whom are here, and tore a rotator cuff tendon. My husband said, were you drinking? And I said, no. <laughs> of the women who whines pitched in to drive me around and bring me food since I needed surgery and was in a sling for six weeks. Kate did bring me food, store-bought since in addition to cats she's allergic to cooking, <laughs> and insisted on driving me home from campus one winter night after I taught an evening class. Ladies and gentlemen, there's nothing better than walking across a cold, dark street and seeing the shining taillights from Kate's jaunty car, the top of her fuzzy white head barely visible in the driver's seat. I saw her smiling face and waving hands and burst out laughing when she opened the door. She greeted me with her customary loud peals of laughter. What the hell's so funny, Rock Castle? She said. And that says it all. And now Jean Stevenson will come up and give the award to Kate. It was early February when the Curlin Awards Selection Committee met. So think back, no don't, to snow and ice. Um, and we really, we sat in the workroom surrounded by manuscript boxes and we looked at the names and then people began saying, Kate DiCamillo, Kate DiCamillo, her name just bubbled up. And with every time someone said that, there were stories attached. There was no question, Kate, none. The committee's privilege then is to call the recipient. So we called her and had got her answering machine. <laughs> <laughs> so I s left my office phone number in Duluth on her answering machine and said, I'll call you Monday morning. She'd already called me, and when I picked up the phone, it, all I got was, Jean, this is Kate, wow! <laughs> and every other word was wow. There were, there were no questions. Please, Kate, come and get them. is hereby presented to Katie Camillo in recognition of singular attainments in, creating, in the creating of children's literature and in appreciation for generous donations of unique resources to the Curlin Collection for the Study of Children's Literature. Thank, Thank you. you. How are y'all doing? <laughs> um, Jean, thank you. Lisa, thank you. Julie and Mary. That was pretty great, except for a few parts. <laughs> um, I, I've had a lot of advice this morning. Jane Rush Thomas said, it's really hard talking to people you know, good luck. So that was helpful. <laughs> Lorna Landvik back there said, it's not about you. Um, and that was oddly helpful too. <laughs> and um, Mary said, and this is a direct quote, you should go back into therapy when I was expressing <laughs> how nervous I was. So, um, <clears throat> I've written a speech and um, 
after it's over, I'm hoping that y'all will ask me questions because that's the only part that I like about standing up in front of people is talking with you. But in the meantime, you have to do a speech. There's no choice, so you guys have to listen to it. <laughs> uh, I, I gave it a title. It's called Storks Work and Better Health Through Better Plumbing. <laughs> In Out of Africa, Isaac Dennison tells a story that was told to her when she was a child. The story goes like this. A farmer hears a loud noise in the middle of the night and goes outside to investigate. In the darkness, searching for the sound, the farmer falls into a ditch, climbs out of it, stumbles over a stone, rights himself, falls into another ditch, climbs out. The farmer goes to the north and the south, to the east and the west through the muck and the mud, and finally exhausted, he goes back to bed without ever having discovered the source of the noise. In the morning, the farmer looks down from his bedroom window and sees his footprints from the night before. The marks that he left as he stumbled and ran, lost through the dark, have formed a pattern. They have traced the beautiful shape of a stork. Denison ends her retelling of this story with these words. The tight place, the dark pit in which I am now lying, of what bird is it the talon? When the design of my life is completed, shall I, shall other people see a stork? Nineteen years ago, I was in a tight place, a dark pit. The tight place was entirely of my own devising. The dark pit was born of fear and laziness. Basically, the problem was this. I was 30 years old and I had known for the past 10 years that I wanted to be a writer. But I did not write. I purchased books on writing. I read some of them. I told people that I was a writer and I wore black turtlenecks. <laughs> but I did not write. I dreamed big dreams. I pontificated, I gnashed my teeth, I made everyone around me want to gnash their teeth but I didn't write. It was a very tight place, a ridiculously dark pit. And then when I was 30 years old, something happened. I guess you could say that I, like Isaac Dennison's farmer, heard a noise in the night. I woke up a little, just enough to go stumbling outside to investigate. My stumbling led me from Florida to Minnesota. And in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, I got a job working in a warehouse for a book distributor called The Bookman. The Bookman warehouse looked like something out of a Dickens novel. <laughs> it was an old red brick building with the words, better health through better plumbing, <laughs> emblazoned in faded peeling letters on its west side. The warehouse was filled with books and with people who loved to read books. It was cold in the wintertime and stifling in the summertime. The floors were cement. There were tall, wide windows. On winter afternoons, sunlight streamed into the warehouse and lit it up like a cathedral. In The Magician's Elephant, the elephant that the magician conjures, entirely by mistake and also very much on purpose, smells like dried apples and moldy paper and dung. And this was the way the bookman smelled to me. <laughs> It was the odor of possibility and impossibility, the smell of the dusty, broken world mingled with the scent of paper stories. In the lobby of the bookman, there was a coffee vending machine. For 10 cents, you could get a cup of coffee, a squirt of powder followed by a stream of hot water, delivered to you in a paper cup that featured a poker hand imprinted on its side. I didn't know how to play poker. But still, I studied the cards on my coffee cup. They promised me something. Here they were, the cards I had been dealt. How would I play them? The coffee itself was uniformly, undeniably terrible. There is a Peanuts cartoon strip in which Linus makes a cup of hot chocolate for Lucy by melting a brown crown in hot water. <laughs> he asks Lucy how it tastes, and she says, it tastes like some warm water that has had a brown crown dipped in it. <laughs> That's the way the 10 cent poker handed coffee at the Bookman tasted. And I loved it. 
I arrived at work at 7 in the morning and I would clock in and go out to the lobby and put a dime in the coffee vending machine and then I climbed the stairs to the third floor where I stood at one of the windows and drank my truly lousy coffee and watched the sky lighten. The sky in Minnesota was different from the sky in Florida and I could not stop marveling over it. It seemed almost otherworldly to me. Once I saw a Christmas card that featured a painting of a snowy field and a split rail fence and some birds and a tree and a blue sky. Ordinary things, a quotidian winter world, but hanging in the blue sky just above the tree was planet Earth. On the back of the card was the title of the painting. It was called A Different Place Entirely. And that's the way I felt standing at the Bookman window in the early mornings looking out at the indigo sky and watching the stars fade. I had the strange notion that where I had always thought myself to be was not where I truly was. I experienced the dizzyan sense of the known world pushing itself up against the unknown one. It was an odd sensation. There was freedom in it. Where was I? I was in a different place entirely. There is a Buddhist precept that goes something like this. The only thing that you deserve is the chance to do the work. That's all. Just the chance. Somehow, the coffee machine and the poker hand cups, the tall windows and the strange and wonderful sky, the books all around me with their smell of dust and possibility, somehow these things conspired to make me understand something that I had not understood before. I saw clearly that I had been given a chance. I started to do the work. I started to write. At the Bookman, I was assigned to the third floor. My job title was picker. This meant that I went around the warehouse floor with a shopping cart and a pick list, a computerized printout that detailed the title of the book, its location in the warehouse, and the quantity I should pick. I took the books off the shelf, put them in the cart, took the cart downstairs to the packing department via a huge and extremely temperamental freight elevator, and then came back upstairs, picked up another order and another shopping cart, and began again. I liked picking, and I guess it was inevitable that I would start reading the books that I was picking. The third floor of the bookman, my floor, was where the children's books were. I began by reading picture books, and then I moved on to novels. The first children's novel that I read was Christopher Paul Curtis's The Watsons Go to Birmingham, 1963. I remember standing on the cement floor, holding the paperback of The Watsons open in my left hand and balancing a stack of books on my right arm. I remember the light streaming in the windows behind me. I remember my feet hurting, my heart unfurling. This, I thought, this is what I want to do. This is the kind of book I want to try and write. A book that tells the truth and makes the truth bearable somehow. The Watsons Go to Birmingham was followed by Bridge to Ter Terabithia, and then came Abel's Island, Ringer, The Slave Dancer, Skellig, Letters from Rivka, Maniac McGee, Walk Two Moons, The Giver, The Door in the Wall, The Great Gilly Hopkins, Catherine Called Birdie, Holes, all on the clock, basically, but <laughs> I was still a really fast picker. I always got my work done. I could just read and walk. I read and read and read, and with each book, my heart unfurled more, further. Something inside of me opened. I got up very early in the morning in those days. The alarm was set for 4.30. I wrote two pages as soon as I got out of bed and then I went off to work at the Bookman. I wrote, I picked books, I read books, I got up and did it all over again. I was happy in a way that I'd never been happy before. I'd been given a chance to do the work and I was doing it. I was working, I was becoming myself. My second winter in Minnesota was a particularly brutal one. There were several days in a row where the high everybody was around for this, it's nice to say it in Minnesota, um, was 32 degrees below zero. Um, and I stood at the windows of the bookman in those early mornings and stared out at the strange sky and thought with longing of Florida. In particular, I thought about the greenhouse 
and Bernice. When I was 20 years old and had just graduated from college and was certain that what I wanted to do was become a writer, I got a job in a greenhouse that grew variegated philodendrons. The work in the greenhouse consisted mostly of cutting eyes, a leaf and a stem of a mature plant, and sticking the eyes into pots so that they could take root and start a new plant. It was not hard work, but it was relentless, hot, oddly exhausting work. And even though there was a clear progression, a pattern of things growing, changing, becoming, stem, leaf, dirt, small pot, stem takes root, plant grows large and then larger still, the work itself seemed absolutely pointless to me. I worked with several other ladies, all of them were older than I was, and one of them, Bernice, was in her 70s. Every morning, Bernice greeted me with the same words. Sister Kate, what you gonna do with that college degree? <laughs> Every morning, I answered her the same way. I said, I am going to be a writer. And Bernice said, uh-huh, when you gonna start writing? Soon, I said. Uh-huh, she said again. I wasn't fooling Bernice, but I was doing a pretty good job of fooling myself. I told myself that I was waiting. I told myself that surely some sign would appear, some inspiration would strike, some divine intervention would occur, and then, then I would write. In the meantime, I was stuck, lost, drifting in a hot and becalmed sea. On the west side of the greenhouse, there was a pecan tree. One hot afternoon during our lunch break, I watched as Bernice collected pecans from the base of the tree. What are you doing? I asked. What's it look like I'm doing? Picking up nuts? That's right. Why? Why? Why do you think? I'm going to make a pecan pie. The sun was hot and the sky was blue and we were on our lunch breaks and here was Bernice bending and standing and bending and standing collecting pecans, working. It seemed crazy to me. I went down to the lake and jumped in and cooled off and by the time I made it back to the greenhouse, I was hot again. Bernice was still outside under the pecan tree gathering nuts. Something about this annoyed me. Why don't you just go and buy a pecan pie, I said to her. <laughs> don't want someone else's pecan pie, she said without looking up at me. I want my pecan pie. I would stand at the window of the bookman on winter mornings and look out at the frozen world and imagine the warmth of the greenhouse. I would hear Bernice's voice saying, don't want someone else's pecan pie, I want my pecan pie. Bernice had been telling me to do my work. I couldn't hear her then, but I could hear her now. And there was another voice that winter. It was the voice of a girl with a southern accent. One night, right before I fell asleep, I heard the girl say a single sentence. I have a dog named Win Dixie. The next morning when I got up to write, that girl, that voice was waiting for me. I listened to her, I followed her, I did my work. I bent and straightened and bent again. I wrote two pages and then two more. Winter slowly gave way to spring. Earlier this year, I visited the Curlin along with students in Julie Schumacher's undergraduate children's literature class. Is that what it is? It's a children's literature class? And they are undergrads, right? <coughs> I sat with them and listened to Lisa von Drasic talk about the Curlin, its missions, its holdings, the archives, the manuscripts, the art. And then suddenly there it was on a screen in front of all of us, the first page of the first draft of Because of Wind Dixie. Those words that I had typed years ago in a dark room on a dark winter morning when I was homesick and cold. There it was, the beginning. And it was an absolute pure D mess. The students laughed looking at it. <laughs> I laughed. The manuscript is full of misspellings, digressions, wanderings, typos, missteps, wrong turns. But somehow all this wandering, stumbling lostness had assumed a shape, a meaning. It had become a book. Impossible as it seems, it happened. How? By bending and standing and bending again. And by that, I mean work. But also, it happened this way, by faith. 
And by that, I mean the willingness to be lost, the trust involved in following a voice, a noise in the night. Art making, say Bales and Orland in their book Art and Fear, involves skills that can be learned. The conventional wisdom here is that while craft can be taught, art remains a magical gift bestowed only by the gods. Not so. In large measure, becoming an artist consists of learning to accept yourself, which makes your work personal, and in following your own voice, which makes your work distinctive. Clearly, these qualities can be nurtured by others. Even talent is rarely distinguishable over the long run from perseverance and hard work. Sitting with those students, looking up at that rough draft, I couldn't help but think of the novel that I'm working on now. It's a mess, and I'm lost. Looking at that page reminded me of the power of work and of the courage and hope, the faith involved in allowing yourself to be lost. The bookman has gone out of business. The warehouse has been turned into condos. The old tall windows have been replaced. The freight elevators no longer exist. There was a day, I suppose, when they came to collect the coffee vending machine, unplugged it, removed it, wheeled it away. All those poker hand cups, someone else's hope went elsewhere. The books are gone. Of course the books are gone. The books would have been the first things to go. And the words that were painted on the side of the building, better health through better plumbing, those words are gone too. If you bring forth what is within you, say the Gnostic Gospels, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. Maureen Vance, one of Julie's students who visited the Curlin that day, wrote an essay using the tale of Despero manuscripts. She focused on the development of the scene in which Despero forgives his father for banishing him to the dungeon. In the final paragraph of her essay, Vance says, progress sometimes requires regress. The character and author must undergo hardship, revision, and reassessment before they learn what is most important. There is no guarantee that the process will be easy, but merely every hope that the outcome will be worth it. That's it. That's what the, what? I'm not done, wait. <laughs> Boy, you guys are eager to get rid of me. I've tied it all up in a tight, tight little knot here. I wanna get to it, okay. So that is what the curlin is about. It's about believing that the outcome will be worth it. It's about believing that if we work, and if we hope, and if we listen, we will, in the end, see the shape of something beautiful, something that we have longed for and not at all anticipated. Forgiveness, love, a stork. Wait a minute, I want to say one more thing. Um, I want to thank the Curlin Committee and readers and writers, all of you, for this recognition, for giving me the chance to do the work. And I'd like to accept this award today in honor of my teacher, friend, and fellow writer, Jane Resch Thomas. Yeah. to answer questions um, yeah. since I lived through the speech. It, yeah, was, through were you disappointed with that no, speech? No, no, the speech was excellent. Um, I, I do know that you like to take questions, but I also know that I'll be the person keeping track of the time. So you just enjoy your conversation, and I'll give you a last question signal okay. in the bossy way that I do. You are very bossy. Uh, yes. Well, you <laughs> Lisa wrote the first review of Because of Wind Dixie, um, and it was in Kirkus. And I've known Lisa uh, for a long time, and I never knew that that was her. That because the Kirkus reviews are anonymous. We're anonymous. Yeah, yeah. She followed me. <laughs> okay. You can go sit down it now, was, Lisa. Yeah. yeah okay. I'll give you a All right. Okay. All right. Some questions. Yeah, I'll take some questions. So who's got questions? This is a problem with adults. You all, no one wants to. Are there kids? Oh, oh no, Lorna's got a question. Okay. 
I just want to know when you travel, do you keep your two-page minimum or is it a maximum? Do you write when you're traveling? I do not write when I'm, I'm traveling. I don't. Do you? It's about you, Kate. <laughs> you told me it was not about me. That's how I got up here. No, I can't, I can't, I can't. I, but I do find, this is the great thing about traveling, I always have a notebook with me and, um, and traveling, uh, so I'm not doing the actual two pages a day, but a lot of ideas come to me when I'm traveling and, and most of those come from, uh, you know, eavesdropping. You, people say astonishing things to each other, so, and I write them down. Yes, thank you. My favorite book that I wrote, Are You an Only Child? Do you have brothers and sisters? Yes. Yeah, how many brothers and sisters? And is the person sitting next to you related to you in some way? Is, is it a, a parental figure there? No. Yes, yeah, that's, that's your mom. Okay, so now I'm gonna ask your mom a question in order to answer your question, okay? Which of those children do you love the best? <laughs> so the, the books are like my kids, and so I can't pick a favorite because I love them all equally. Um, I see them as deeply flawed but lovable, which is not how your mother sees you, I'm not saying that. <laughs> But you, you know, I can't, I can't pick a favorite because I love them equally but in different ways. Yes. People hate this question. Great, good. You can't give me the same answer though that you just gave to this. I can't? No. <laughs> well, you're taller than I am, so yeah. <laughs> what are your five, three, four, it doesn't matter, favorite books? Yeah, that's, that's a little bit easier than dealing with my own books, but it's still virtually impossible, but still because you're taller than I am, I'm going to try. Um, uh, I have a biography of Isaac Dennison by Judith Thurman that I reread every year, and um, I'm not a big rereader. I could not live without that book. Um, it, it sheds insight on what it means to be... Um, a storyteller, the dangers and the rewards of it. Um, so that book, uh, Charlotte's Web, which I did not read until I was in Jane Resch Thomas's workshop and um, she threatened me uh, that I had to read it if I had any, and that gets better every time I read it, Charlotte's Web. Um, Nobody's Fool by Richard Rousseau. I remember uh, I remember reading that in one great greedy gulp and the humanity in it um, really affected me profoundly and the humor. Uh, Ann Tyler's uh, The Accidental Tourist. That was the first time I thought um, I want to I want to try and, and do this and then I sat around for 15 years and didn't. Um, and. Uh, the Watsons go to Birmingham 1963 because it did open a door for me. So, was that five? Yeah. All right, great. Whew, I'm sweating. Okay. Um, yes. Can you talk a little bit about how writing a picture book like Louise is different than writing a Sure. Um, the difference between writing a picture book and a novel. In a novel, um, you've got a, a lot more uh, room to hide your mistakes. There's nowhere to hide in a picture book. And uh, I, they're really, really hard to do. And, I, and um, it's kind of like writing poetry except with page turns, because where the page turn comes really matters too. And uh, it's nice to think, oh, this will be nice and short and easy and simple, and it's a lot in, I won't have to spend the time that I spend with the novel, but it's not so. And in a, in a novel, you can like cover up all kinds of errors. So, and I've come to believe that um, uh, if I have a, t a talent, it lies in, in novel writing as opposed to, to picture books. Um, as opposed to, like, say, Phyllis Root, who is a genius at writing a picture book, and when you, or Mo Willems, when you read the work of a genius, you think, you always think the same thing, oh, I could do that, 
That's why Madonna writes a picture book, right? Is because she reads it and she thinks, oh, I could do this. <laughs> and remember when Max was a baby and I w w y you read Knuffle Bunny every night and you never get tired of reading it. And so then as a writer, I take it home and I type it up and thinking, you know, because I'm thinking the same thing as Madonna, I can do this. And um, it's hardly any words at all and you can't, it's a genius, you know, so. Wasn't that illuminating? I don't. I don't know how you do it. Um, yes. Is there, um, you say you uh, get up early in the morning and write your two pages. Is there a different quality of time or a different place in time where you edit or rewrite, or is it? In the same it's a it's a very smart question. So I, I will answer in a long, involved kind of way. Um, it's a, did everybody hear the question? Is there is there a different time for editing or rewriting than there is for writing? Um, so what I have found is. Uh, for me, the best time is as soon as I wake up. And when I say as soon as I wake up, I mean like right from the bed into the the office, um, and to me, that's uh, more deep, deeply connected to um, dreaming. And also, I've found that the voice that says, um, "Who do you think you are? You can't do this. You don't know what you're doing. This isn't going to work." That voice um, doesn't wake up until like nine o'clock. <laughs> so. If I get in there early, um, then by the time I'm done, um, that voice will will start asking me about what I did, but it's already done. So, but you need that voice later on for when you're rewriting, the voice that asks all the questions and demands for things to be just so. And so when I am uh, doing the final edits after I've got an editorial letter, then I work in the afternoon because it has to be a much more critical thing. But when I'm creating that's in the morning before that critical part of me is fully awake. Last yes. One. Last one? Oh, we're just getting started. <laughs> well, they can have lunch with you. Okay, all right, okay. I, I teach third grade in rural Wisconsin, and my favorite book to read is The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane. And I was wondering, when you were writing about Edward's journeys, did you have journeys that in your head or somewhere on paper that you didn't put in the book? Huh. Or did they come, you know, were all of his journeys included or did you have ideas so maybe he should do this? No, I didn't. I actually, it was a book that, um, it was a strange writing experience and the kind of writing experience that it ruins you for the next book because it wrote itself. And um, and then you think, wow, I've really cracked this novel writing thing. Now, now I figured it out. <laughs> And that was just a one-off, apparently. So I didn't do any of the like thinking that you n normally do when you're writing. It, I just wrote down what happened. And so I didn't have any questions about other trips or anything like that because I just knew exactly what was coming next as it unfolded. I just wrote it down. So it was a very strange experience. Lisa's coming to get me. I want to ask you a question. When you read that book out loud, um, at, at the end, do you cry? It's, um, yeah, actually it's kind of hard to talk about because for my students, this is the first time they've ever heard someone read a sad, sad part. So when they see me tear up, it's really, it's really an emotional thing with kids. Yeah, because it scares they, them when you cry. They're kind of scared and then some of them aren't really sure what's going on because they might not have that in their life. So they're like, what's Mrs. Moles? What, What's going on? <laughs> they, don't, they don't even know what that is, but it's really an opening experience for them that shows them that books, books, you know, can find that place in you that you can share lots of emotions through a book, and it really changes them as readers. And I find that after I read this book, that they are more engaged in their reading after it. So it's it's just one of my oh. favorite books to read. Wow, let's end there, right? <laughs> yeah. So the, the Curlin comes with an honorarium and um, uh, what I have done is 
Th these are two pieces of original art, one from the Stinky Cheese Man, and then that's a Jim McMullen from I'm Mighty. Uh, and so uh, we're going to take that money and get this art for the Curlin. And um, I would like to do it and say it in front of y'all in <laughs> honor of um, Lisa's uh, father-in-law, uh, Doc Von Drasic, who passed earlier this year and who I, I loved. He was a very great man. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's where the honorarium went, went. and um, and now we're going to eat lunch, I guess. Or? Um, I have announcements. Could you oh. sit down? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs>